it is said that uh, the biggest difficulty in understanding Christianity is the institution of Sunday school. The biggest difficulty in understanding Plato and Platonic thought is college and university philosophy courses. Because in both cases, there's a certain significant spiritual dimension that is ignored. And I would like to take up tonight the spiritual dimension of Plato in terms of one of the short dialogues, it's only 25 pages long, called The Apology, and it happens to be one of my favorite dialogues. It's one of my favorite ones because it makes a spiritual dimension of philosophy its central issue. Now let me first tell you about the structure of the dialogue. I always go into structure. Do you would like? Yes, a I'm just curious. When did this spiritual dimension stop being important? Uh, it's not spiritual anymore. It's just a taught. I don't know whether it stopped because it only entered Europe with the Latin translations of Plato in the late 15th, 16th century. Philosophy has only been taught through the universities. So it has always been a secular yeah, thing? Yeah, no, no. Because Europe, we get our philosophy from Europe. Europe has redefined philosophy to serve its own needs. So let me see whether I can express this in the dialogue itself rather than just talking general. As an example, this is the great dialogue, the apology. This is the Socrates' trial. This is his defense. It is often explored as a trial, thinking that that's its significance. Let me point out a few things just in terms of structure. The entire dialogue is approximately, depending upon how you cut the pages, but approximately 25 pages. Socrates sets out his goal in the first two pages. The goal is quite simple, he says. The goal is to remove the prejudices. He wants to face the prejudices against him. He therefore addresses the court with only one challenge, and the challenge is Please consider one thing and attend carefully to that, whether my plea is just or not. Well, then what is his plea and what's the nature of the prejudice? Therefore, he first sets out these two points in the first two pages. Then he introduces what he calls his first accusers, false accusers accusing him of things which in their very nature is a prejudice. The whole work is a study of the nature of prejudice. A prejudice is a false accusation. Therefore, he takes his first accusers, which he calls those that have been around the longest, and he explores their accusations against him. Then when that's over, which only takes five pages, he then addresses the formal charges that are presented against him. That's the affidavit, the written affidavit. He only spends four pages on that, and he says at the end of the four pages, that's enough. Therefore, what's the rest of the dialogue doing? In this section, which is seven full pages, is an exploration of what he thinks is the nature of this prejudice and why it's against him. Then in ju Athenian justice, the system of justice, the courts, you vote twice. You vote twice. First, you vote whether or not you think the person is guilty of the charges. That's the first vote. Then, if the person is guilty, judge guilty, then 
the charge, you see, is clear, and so is the penalty. The penalty is right there in the charges, in the bottom line. Penalty, in this case, death. So there is no doubt about the penalty. Why the second vote? It gives the opportunity, it gives an opportunity to the person who's been judged guilty, the opportunity to create their own penalty. And therefore, the guilty party has to submit what they consider to be a just penalty. It goes back to the jury. The jury then has to decide between the two of them, which one shall be invoked. So therefore, Socrates offers his own penalty. Then the jury has to then decide of the two, and of course, they choose the one, death. That's the structure. Clearly, he is not interested at all beyond just dealing with it formally, the charges, for a very interesting reason. The charges literally are true. If you use the work itself, if you use the work itself as a basis for judging whether or not there is evidence that can be used to support the charges, the answer is yes. If we set out the charges of the second accusers, second set of accusers are the formal, formal charges that are offered against him, and if we open up this book and look at it, this dialogue, and look for evidence to see whether we can see evidence that would confirm those charges, the evidence is quite clear, yes. Therefore, there's no question about his guilt, he's guilty. Now, we can vote, we'll vote tonight. You see, you can vote that he's guilty of the charges, and then you can agree that he should get the penalty he offers. And he has a marvelous penalty, which probably so disturbed the jury that they voted for his death rather than even conceive of the possibility of giving it to him in any serious way. So then, let me tell you. What is this prejudice because that's what we have to see whether his plea is just or not. What's the prejudice? He breaks it up into, he says, look, the first charge, it's an old charge. That is that I'm a criminal and a busybody prying into things under the earth and up in the heavens and making the weaker argument appear the stronger and teaching these things to others, these same things to others. He says, look, her. you see, we don't see much in this, but in fact, this is being a witch, right? This is really big. Prying into the things under the earth, chathonic, right? The underworld and up in the heavens. This is, the, this is a prejudice against a certain class of people. And he's very clear about that because after he finishes dismissing the first set of charges, which is really a pretended affidavit, he says, these are nothing other than the stock charges against all philosophers. What's the prejudice then? The prejudice is against philosophy. Therefore, what is his defense? The whole apology? A defense of philosophy. Therefore, we have to see what he means by philosophy. Because it's quite clear, it's quite clear that people then have a view of philosophers and the view they have of philosophers is that they are these kinds of people who do this kind of thing. Now he has a very interesting strategy <clears throat> which I should just spend a few minutes on. <clears throat> As you know, these are old accusations against him, what they accuse him of. Not real, they're not written. So he says, I will pretend to read a pretended affidavit of the charges. So he's there pretending to read a pretended affidavit. Therefore, he's translating the false accusers who have been accusing of these things and making believe they are a set of charges. And therefore, he dismisses each one of the charges, taking them sequentially. Now, when the real charges come, he turns around and he says, by the way, I'm going to take these charges and treat them as if they were another set of accusers. Well, I would like to spend a few minutes showing you he's guilty, and then I would like to deal with this central problem, and that's the spiritual dimension that runs through the entire work. 
that has grand significance to us all. The charges first. You read the charges backwards. You read the charges backwards and you can see what they are. First, if Socrates believes in other new spiritual things instead of the gods the state believes in, and if he teaches those things to others, then he corrupts the young. That makes him a criminal. Therefore, there's just one, one serious charge here. And the charge is, does, or does, he, does Socrates believe in other new spiritual things instead? If he does, clearly if they are new, and if the state doesn't believe in them, the charges are true. If in any way he teaches these things or influences others to believe in them, then we can say he corrupts the young. If it's, against the, if it's against the state rules to introduce a new spiritual thing instead of belief in the gods the state believes in, if that's a stated law, then he's guilty of breaking that stated law. It's not a question whether he's just in doing that or not. The question is whether or not he's guilty of the law as stated. Therefore, let's do it again. If we can find that he does believe in other new spiritual things, and these things are not those things that the state believes in, and if he then persuades or in any way influences the young to go along with those beliefs, then he can be charged with corrupting the young, and that makes him a criminal. And if at the bottom of these great charges there's the penalty of death, then we have the whole story of the trial. That's right. That's right. So, would you agree all we need to do is prove that he believes in new spiritual things instead? We can put aside all the other secondary issues and deal with that most directly. Now the question is, while, while he is doing this, while Socrates is doing this, what he also offers is the fact that he doesn't believe in the gods the state believes in. Wait a minute, look at while he is defending this view, which is not a defense, he's stating the facts, while he's defending his own view, he's going to show you, number one, all right, that he tries to disprove the oracle of Apollo, the Delphic oracle. He tries to disprove the oracle sacred to Apollo. Not prove it, disprove it. And that was one of his great drives. Well, wait a minute. So therefore, while he is going around doing what he's doing, he's then challenging the, the very oracle. He's going around to disprove it. We need a statement that shows that. We also need another statement to show that he does believe in spiritual things, and they have to be new things, and they have to be instead of the gods the state believes in. Third. We also want a simple statement from Socrates that he recognizes he does believe in God, but not in the way any of his accusers do. And therefore, it would be in a way of understanding to God in a totally different way, and that's exactly what the state is saying. All right, so what do we need? We have to show that he's, dis he's going around disproving the oracle sacred to Apollo. He's introducing a new spiritual thing and he recognizes he believes in God in a way in which none of his accusers do. Ah, let me write that a little better. Now, I'll submit one more, a couple of more things. You will agree that the most important thing to keep in mind when the jury goes into their deliberations is what is said in the last 30 seconds. That's what that's going to be fresh on their mind and that's what they're going to work, walk away with. This is what he tells them, the closing statement before the vote. That's very clear in his mind. He's going to then talk about why he needs to, attack, to challenge the oracle. Because he says, there's one thing that people accuse me of, and that is wisdom. And he says, that's true. I have a certain kind of wisdom. 
That's right, I have a certain kind of wisdom, and that's what I pursue. Philosophy is a love of wisdom. It's important for us to know what he means by wisdom. So then, our task is simple. All I have to do is read you a couple of quotes here. I have eight quotes I'm interested in here, two in here. We should be able to pull it all together. And that's where we're going. My trusted old book. I brought another one that I had to uh, recover. But um, I just fr freshly explored this. Therefore, let me first take up the first point. Socrates is going to be talking about where he got this reputation for wisdom. And he says, it was, of course, a friend of mine, Shafiron, he, he's everyone knows Shafiron, he was a talker. Wisdom. I'll tell you the whole truth. The sort of wisdom has gotten me this name, gentlemen, and nothing else. Wisdom! Exclamation point. What wisdom? Uh, perhaps the only wisdom that man can have. For the fact is, I am, uh, I really am wise in this wisdom. But it may be that those I just spoke of are wise in a wisdom greater than man's. Or I can't think of how to describe it, for I don't understand it myself. Whoever, so, whoever says so uh, lies. Then he tells the audience, hey, calm down, calm down, calm down. It upsets them all. He said, I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to tell you is not my word, but I'll refer to a speaker of sufficient authority. I will call the god in Delphi as my witness of my wisdom. I will call the god in Delphi. Ah! Here's a very clear case. All he has to say is, I believe in the God of Delphi. That will show, therefore, he at least is holding to the notion that he believes in the God the states believe in, and we won't have any trouble. Socrates can announce that he's innocent. By the way, if, however, he challenges the gods at Delphi and tries to disprove them, you and I will come to a different conclusion. So this is what he says. I suppose you know Shafiron. He's been my friend since I was young. And a friend of your people's party. And he was banished with you lately and with you restored. And you know doubtless what sort of man he was. How impetuous in all he tried to do. Well, once he went to Delphi and dared to ask this question of the oracle. Don't make an uproar, gentlemen, at what I say. For he asked if anyone was wiser than I was. The priestess answered then that no one was wiser. Hey, his brother is here. He'll bear witness to this. As Shafiron is dead. But let me tell you why I say this. I'm going to show you where all this calumny, false accusations, come from. Well, when I heard that, I thought, what in the world does the God mean? What in the world is this riddle? For I know in my conscience that I'm not wise in anything, great or small. Then what in the world does he mean when he says, I'm the wisest? Surely he's not lying. He says, now I was puzzled for a long time and I tried to understand it. He said, then I thought of a way to try to find out. He said, I approached one of those men who had the reputation of being wise and I thought there, if anywhere, I should test the revelation and prove that the oracle was wrong. What's he doing? He's going to test the oracle and prove it wrong. He's going to prove the oracle wrong. That's what he's announcing to the audience, to the jury. The god in Delphi was wrong. Well, then he goes around to see whether anyone is wiser than I am, says Socrates. Well, he goes around, you know what he finds? He finds no one is wiser. <laughs> <laughs> but then he reduces it to a very important issue, a very important statement. Because we have to see how he puts it. He says, He 
He said, of course, I checked the poets and I checked the tragedians and I check, checked out workmen and craftsmen and they, they didn't know what they were doing, he says. So I asked myself on behalf of the oracle whether I should prefer to be as I am, not wise with their wisdom nor ignorant with their ignorance, or to have what they have. I answered myself in the oracle that it was best for me to be as I am. This is from this, a lot of, a lot of hostility arose against me and people were accusing me of many things. Now he reflects on it. He says, for by, bystanders always believe that I am wise myself in the matters in which I test another. But the truth really is, gentlemen, that the God in fact is wise and in this, and this oracle, he means that human wisdom is worth little or nothing and it, and it appears that he does not say this of Socrates but simply adds my name to make me an example. As if he were to say that this one of you human beings is wisest who like Socrates knows that he is in truth worth nothing as regards wisdom. I say, you know what? Young people love to go around and watch me cross-examine people. Here he is. He says, young people, those who have the most leisure, follow me of their own accord delighted to hear people being cross-examined. They often imitate me and they try themselves to cross-examine cross others. And there are plenty of people who've seen the consequences. Uh-oh. Corrupts the young. Doesn't believe in the gods the state believes in. Influences others to believe the same. Quite clear. He says, therefore, you know what? He says, the people are upset and therefore they repeat the stock charges against philosophers and he says, that's what I am. That's the nature of the prejudice. There's a prejudice against philosophy. That's the removal of the prejudice. In order to do that, he said, I must first do away with these false accusations. That confuses everything because they don't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Now he says, look here. Everything I'm doing can be reduced to one statement, and it's a magnificent statement. It's one of my favorite statements. He says, what I'm doing, my practice, is to take every care and thought for understanding, for truth, and for the soul, so that it may be perfect. He says, That's my goal. That's what it is to do philosophy. That's what it is. So now, we're finishing with the first charge, and he ends with this one statement. The result is, as I began by saying, that I should be surprised if I could erase this prejudice from you in so short a time, when it has grown so great. This gentleman is the truth. This gentleman is the truth. I have hidden nothing, I have hidden nothing great or small, and dissemble nothing. And I know well enough that these same things make me disliked, which is another proof that I'm speaking the truth and that this is the prejudice against me. And these are the causes. Ah, now he takes on the second set. The second set. You know, we've already discussed how we're gonna proceed. Very simply, we won't have any trouble. Oh, we have to see if he believes in new spiritual things instead of the God, well, those gods that the state believes in? Now, what I'm going to do is respond to those charges by reading material that is here throughout and then I'm going to put them in order in a few minutes. So right now I'm going to jump a bit. I'm going to get a quote right here, a couple of quotes right here. And see whether you'll come along with me and vote the man guilty. That's my purpose. How are we going to vote? Guilty.
You think of this now. You're in the jury. You've been told by Socrates to please consider one thing and attend carefully to that, whether his plea is just or not. You now have to review the charges. You have to see whether there's evidence supporting the charges. So here's his quote. Perhaps it may seem odd that although I go about and give all this advice privately, I'm quite a busybody, quite a busybody, I'm quite a busybody. He's waking them up to the very charges. Yet I dare not appear before you, your public assembly, and advise the state. The reason for this is one which you have often heard me giving in many places. That something divine and spiritual comes to me which Miletus put into the indictment. He's telling you, isn't he? He's telling you. Hey, he put Miletus, you see, drew up this, these charges. He put it in the indictment. Here it is. The reason for this is one which you have often heard me giving in many places, that something divine and spiritual comes to me which Miletus put into the indictment. Hey, it's been around since my, my boyhood. It's a voice which, when it comes, always turns me away from doing something I'm intending to do but never urges me on. This is what opposes my taking up public business. Quite right, too, I think. For you may be sure, gentlemen, that uh, if I had meddled in, with public business in the past, I should have perished long ago and done no good either to you or to myself. Now, don't be annoyed at my telling the truth. The fact is that no man in the world will come off safe who honestly opposes either you or any other multitude and tries to hinder the many unjust and illegal things in a state. It's necessary that one who really and truly fights for the right, if he's to survive even for a short term, must act as a private man. Oh, does he believe in new spiritual things instead from that quote? Now, let's see whether we can Let's see whether we can get him even more involved. Right. He believes in new spiritual things instead. To what degree is his vocation as a philosopher seen by Socrates to be a consequence of some spiritual influence? If we can nail that down too, we'll be able to have a better case, a better case to convict him. So let me submit this one. Well, why do some people enjoy spending a great deal of time with me? You've heard why, gentlemen. I've told you the whole truth. They enjoy hearing men cross-examined who think they're wise and are not. Indeed, that is not unpleasant. See, this is his goal. He goes around doing this, both for himself and for others. This is his game. This is philosophy does it to himself and to others. So watch what he concludes now. And I maintain that I have been commanded by the God to do this through oracles and dreams and in every way in which some divine influence of, uh, divine influence of other has ever commanded a man to do anything now, is that a rather bold statement? Let me do it again. And I maintain that I have been commanded by the God to do this through oracles and dreams and in every way in which some divine influence or other has ever commanded a man to do anything. Does he think he has a, a job from the God? very clearly. And if you're in the audience, wouldn't you want at that time to know whether he's talking about Apollo or Athena? Just what I was going to ask you. Nope. 
Just a, that, never. Through this whole work, he'll never put a name on the God that he's talking about. And if you're in the jury box, you're just waiting for that name to drop, aren't you? Because then he's guilty or innocent. So look here. New? Clearly. Spiritual influence? Clearly. Uh, wait a minute. Does he? Willing to say that he believes in a God in a way in which none of his accusers do just before he goes into, before they go into the, into the jury box and vote? Oh, yes, we have a great quote here. Now I'm going to read you the last two sentences before the vote. Actually, I'll sneak in a third because he uses the word Zeus as someone might when they stub their toe and say, God darn it, or something like that. Watch. Then do not demand, gentlemen, that I should do before you such things as I hold neither honorable nor permissible, most especially by Zeus from one who is persecuted for impiety. That's not, oh, that's not declaring a belief in Zeus, is it? Last two sentences. For clearly, if I should persuade you and compel you by entreaties when you are on Goth, I should be teaching you not to believe in gods. And in my own defense, I should actually accuse myself of not believing in gods. But I am far from that, gentlemen. I do believe in a sense in which none of my accusers does. And that's the very charge, isn't it? That he believes in a God in a way in which none of his accusers do because accusers are representing the values of the state. That's what they hear as they go to vote. He's got one last phrase, and I'll read that. I do believe in a sense in which none of my accusers does, and I trust you and God himself to decide about me in the way that shall be best both for me and for you. They go in and they vote. They're 501 in the jury box because they believe 12 men could easily be manipulated but the higher the number they th they were three three counts you see in a jury you could have 201 if it's a minor offense 501 and 1201 if it was a crime against the state so he got the 501 and so they voted and the count was 281 against 220. Oh yeah, 30 votes. Close. Now look here, what can we do? Laying it out this way, how come there were so many who apparently thought that he's not guilty? I think they were listening. And they decided, you see, you can look at this and think that he's not guilty. Some people make the distinction between guilt and innocence. He may be innocent of the charge. He may be innocent, but guilty of the charges. We may think he is just, but guilty of the charges, especially if the charges are unjust. So it caught people in a bind. Yeah. Now, what did he do then? All right. They now vote, bingo, guilty. What does he do? He now must offer the second, right? He must offer an alternative. Now, this man is incredible. He goes through several pages and he does a couple of things. We're now here. I want to deal with the spiritual dimension in a few minutes, but I just want to go formally through these charges and the consequence of the trial. And he now considers the fact that he was just declared guilty. And he thinks about it. He says, well, gentlemen, I'll tell you what. I must decide what it is I deserve 
Well, he says, I'll tell you what I deserve. It's a great quote. Then what do I deserve? Since I am such as that, something good, gentlemen, if I'm to make the estimate what it ought to be in truth, and further, something good which would be suitable for me. Well, then what is suitable for a poor benefactor who craves to have leisure for your encouragement? Nothing, gentlemen, is so suitable as that such a man should be boarded free in the town hall, which he deserves more than any one of you who has gained the prize at Olympia with a pair of horses or four in hand. Then if I must estimate the just penalty according to my deserts, this is my estimate. Free board in the town hall. There was no town hall. They called it the Pritanium in those days. The Pritanium was a sacred building and it was only used for two occasions. Visiting royalty were housed there for 24 hours, then the place had to be purified. Or, if you won the Olympics with four in hand, four horses, with a chariot, you were given maintenance there for 12 hours, sunrise to sunset. What did he want? Free room and board for the rest of his life at the Britannium, which would be... <laughs> <laughs> That's what he says he deserves. <laughs> and he says, by the way, if you're going to fine me for court expenses, things like that, he says, I'll tell you what I'll pay. He says, I'll pay about uh, $35. That's what would be the equivalent today. 12 pounds. And now the jury goes back, and they, what, what are they going to do with a man like that? It's expensive, um, kill him. Right, I mean... <laughs> I mean, it's insulting what he asked for. It's expensive. The high, it would be the most expensive room in town. Yeah, so at the, sure. no. What would be that? What would be equivalent today if no, someone were to make that? The Blair House? Yeah, well, your wife in prison, that's pretty expensive. Well, what does he want, though? <laughs> he wants a life pension. <laughs> he wants a life pension at the best place in town. Would that be the Blair House or where would that be? Blair House. A suite of rooms where? Someplace. I have no idea by the way. That's how out of it I am. So therefore, he comes back and he says, oh, okay. I got it. He says, well, he said, you should wait a while. He said, you should wait a while. I'll be dead anyhow. He said, I'm over 70. And you guys don't want to wait. He says, all right, okay. So after that, he says, I would like to talk to those people, you know, after the trial, to show you the real meaning of what has happened to me. Because he says, you know what, it's a wonderful thing. So he goes back to this signal, goes back to this spiritual thing that he's believed in his whole life, and he says, you know, that spiritual thing never objected to anything I was saying. And he said, often in discussions, when I'm about to say something, it'll interrupt what I'm saying and I don't say anything. He said, but not during this trial. He said, I was free to say anything I wanted. He said, so right now, he said, I know right away. He said, since this comes from the gods, that everything is fine. I'll tell you, really, that this has happened to me, it's good. And it is impossible that any of us conceives it a right who thinks it's an evil thing to die. I will tell you, really, this has happened to me is good. And it is impossible that any of us conceives it a right who thinks it's an evil thing to die. He says, I have great hope that the, to facing death, he says. Is you know why? He said, because in the next world, he said, it may be that I'll be able to go up there and continue cross-examining the gods themselves and all kinds of heroes that have gone before me. And he said, and therefore we can continue the dialogue in the heavens. This is the way he conducts his trial. Audacious, truthful, flagrantly <laughs> at odds with the many. So now let me go and pull out a little more now key quotes of why he thinks it's his duty to be a philosopher. 
because he deals then with this question and this is the spiritual dimension. He says, look here, if someone were to ask me, Socrates, why do you follow a practice that you now run a risk of the sentence of death? Why do you follow this practice? What is it called? Philosophy. He said, well, I'll tell you why I do that. He said, I'll tell you why I do that. Now he likens it to a commander who posts a soldier at a particular post. He said, and I was at Poet Dadaia. He said, the commander posted me there. He said, that's where I stood. He said, but you know what? He said, but where God posted me as I thought and believed with the duty to be a philosopher and to test myself and others, there I should fear neither death nor anything else, nor desert my post. Right, it's not going to desert his post. How did he get his post? Where God posted me, as I thought and believed, with a duty to be a philosopher, to test myself and others. So I said, you know what, if you ask me to give up philosophy, if you say to me, give up philosophy and you can live your life in Athens, he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to tell you. I should answer you many thanks indeed for your kindness, gentlemen, but I will obey the God rather than you. And as long as I have breath in me and remain able to do it, I will never cease being a philosopher and exhorting you and showing what is in me to anyone whom I meet by speaking to him in my usual way. I'll go up to one of them. My excellent friend, you're an Athenian, a citizen of a great city so famous for wisdom and strength and take every care to be as well off as possible in money, reputation, and, and uh, palace. Then are you not ashamed not to take every care and thought for understanding, for truth, and for your soul, so that it may be perfect? He says, that's what I do. I go around. I do that. Why do I do that? Next quote. For this is what God commands me. Make no mistake. And I think there is no greater good for you in the city in any way than my service to God. Now, you know what I do? All I do is go about, try to persuade you, both young and old, not to care for your bodies, your money. but to care for exceedingly for the soul, to make it as good as possible. I'll tell you that virtue comes not from money, but from virtue comes both money and all other good things for mankind, both in private and public. He's still making up for our gentleman. He's still making up for our gentleman. See, he's dealing with God again and again. Never. And I'll tell you which God. Now, I like the next quote, so skipping a bit, of course. Don't make an uproar, gentlemen. Remain quiet, as I beg you. Hear me without uproars as to what I have to say. For I think it will be to your benefit to hear me. I have something more to say, <laughs> which will perhaps make you shout. And here it comes. Be sure of this, that if you put me to death, being such as I am, you will not hurt me so much as yourselves. Now, therefore, gentlemen, so far from pleading for my own sake, as one might expect, I plead for your sakes, that you may not offend about God's gift 
by condemning me. What does he call himself? God's gift. For if you put me to death, you will not easily find such another. I'm really something <laughs> stuck on the state by the God, though it's rather laughable to say so, for it's for the state is like a big thoroughbred horse, so big that it's a bit slow and heavy, and he wants a gadfly to wake him up. I think that God put me on the state something like that to wake you up and to persuade you and reproach you, every one of you, as I keep settling on you everywhere all day long. Hey, such another will not easily be found by you, gentlemen. And if you will be persuaded, you'll spare me. Now, look at the way he considers himself. Unless God sends you such another in his care for you, that I'm really given by one by God can easily be seen from, from this. And he makes a statement about his life. But where God posted me, as I thought and believed, with the duty to be a philosopher and to test myself and others there, I should fear neither death nor anything else. Those are the quotes that I wanted to show you from this section that shows how Socrates considers himself to be an agent of God, as he perceives it, playing the role of the philosopher on a very high, highest level of spirituality for a very interesting and most significant goal right? to take every care and thought for understanding, for truth, for the soul, so that it may be perfect. The perfection of the soul is the game of philosophy. His game, therefore, is to be a philosopher in this tradition. And he makes a very interesting statement. He says, by the way, what's happening to me he says, it's nothing new. He says, there's a long line of us, and it's not going to stop with me. He says, there'll be others in the future that will meet the same fate because there is this ongoing prejudice against philosophy. That's where he concludes. So, let me ask you. Vote. Time to vote. By show of hands, please. As you listen to the charges, Socrates says a criminal who corrupts the young and doesn't believe in the gods the state believes in, but in other new spiritual things and said, would you say he's guilty? Thank you. Now you have a chance now to vote. The second vote, what should we do with them? <laughs> All right. Maintenance in the town hall? Yeah. Keep them in the Britannia. Pardon me? Keep them in the Britannia. <laughs> <laughs> the national treasure. National treasure. Take them out and just point out to them. They're life in prison. Life? All right. Now, let's go back to the beginning of the dialogue. He says, you must consider just one thing, and only one thing, and attend carefully to that to see whether my plea is just or not. What is he defending? Philosophy. This is a defense, therefore, of philosophy as a spiritual activity, such that he has been given the post by God, and he functions in that way. And that's what we have been bequeathed. Uh, in fairness mm -hmm. to um, mm -hmm. Taking this as a historical event, uh, uh, is there um, something in the dialogue at all about his relationship with House of Bodies? No. He becomes a traitor to the state no. and destroys the state. No. I, I mean, no, nothing in this dialogue. Okay, well. But that was common knowledge. Historically, no. the jury would know that. Yes. And he did 
because of being a teacher of no. Alcibiades. Yes, philosophers unfortunately have to pay a curious price for their failures. Whether it's their failure or the individual's failure or something else. But since he does it all in public, he's a visible. It's not in an ashram, it's not in a monastery. It's all visible. Well, they were accusing him of being a philosopher. He was a philosopher, so he was guilty. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Now he's, what he's trying to do is remove a, the, the mask, the false image, the cloak that surrounds philosophy to tr try to show its spiritual dimension. But in doing that, he's proving that the charges are correct. Um, wouldn't this though, because we think the, we have this natural inbred thing that the word philosophy is a good word, if uh, you change it to he's calling himself a prophet uh, or we could even use the metaphor of a prophet we do accept the fact that there are false prophets sure. isn't it possible sure. there are false philosophers. philosophers well certainly in the end remember he did have a prophecy and that makes him a prophet in that sense uttering a prophecy quite true Oh yes, they have a very difficult decision to make. Uh, so uh, it, no. it's not necessarily that they're opposed to him being a philosopher, they could be opposed to the fact they consider him a false f philosopher. Yeah, except, um, you see, as far as he's concerned, all right, they not. repeat the stock charges against all philosophers. So it looks like they have a certain image in town it's been growing for some time. And as a matter of fact, of course, the word philosopher in this sense was criminal for many, many hundreds of years and probably still is in some countries today. It goes on all the time. It's still going yeah. On. Oh, yeah. There were no acceptable good philosophers for the majority of the Jews? Yeah, they believed what they did. At the time, are you asking whether or not some philosophers escaped this? Yes. Yes. Uh, one of the ironies in this case is that these charges, this charge, which we're calling the second charge, was actually brought up by two men, and one of Socrates' points in the dialogue is, if we could separate the charges of these two people and vote on them separately, I'd never be convicted. Is what we're doing is seeing two coming together, two forces coming together. But you see, he's got a great line here, which I'd like to read to you at the end of this discussion on the charges. And uh, <clears throat> well, gentlemen, I am no criminal, according to Miletus's indictment. That needs no long defense from me to prove, but this is enough. It's over, right here. This is enough. He's not going to spend any more time on it. You see what he actually spent is four, four pages out of 25 dealing with the actual charges. He didn't treat them with any more seriousness than four pages was worth. Yes. Well, he apparently he is group always had to constantly move because the hostility. Was, that's yeah, true. Was, oh yeah. Yeah. And they finally killed him. Yeah. So the story goes. They moved to Sicily or something. Didn't they? Pardon? They moved to another country. Yeah, they moved too. They, yeah. yeah but they yeah. were always getting into politics with the communities. I mean, it's not like they were staying to themselves. Uh, well, um, no, it's, uh, this is, you, you see, this is not separating yourself into a religious community. This is doing it in public. This is, this yeah. is doing it in the Gora, in the marketplace. Now, they offered Socrates that option. He could have left. Yeah. But he refused to leave. Yeah, in the Credo. 
They say, look, Socrates, we paid off everybody. You can just walk out. And he says, no, excuse me. There's something far more significant here, and that's the whole issue of the nature of law itself. And he says, rather than that, he said, I'd rather, I'd rather stay and face my fate. Well, when you're in your um, 70s, it's a little hard to just pack up. No, but I was just saying he doesn't oh, no. believe in the gods of the state, yet he, he goes along with the law. And is he introducing then a new set of laws and gods? Or how to okay. they offered Socrates the option of leaving. His friends came up and said, We'll take you off and no problem. We'll take well, you away. The peculiar interesting thing that Socrates invokes to justify why he stayed in jail and finally took the hemlock is because he says, in our law, and I think this is only true for Athenian law, so far as I know, he said that the basic principle of our law, he said, is that you are given the opportunity, if you disagree with what we are doing, to persuade us that we are wrong. And therefore, if you stay in our community, you always have that right to oppose us and persuade us that you're wrong. Therefore, if you do try and fail to persuade us, well, then you have to take the consequences. And he says, this is so important. This is so important. Because what he is therefore doing in terms of his own values and the value I just mentioned, he turns this into a dialogue with the state and he has a dialogue with 501 people. Now, let me get you that quote from the Credo, because it's a good quote. Um, yeah, here we are, okay. In the Credo, Credo can only reason to a certain point and he can't go any further, so therefore Socrates imagines that he's talking with a woman who represents the law itself. So at this point he says, this is the law speaking to Socrates as it were. Are you so wise that you failed to see that something else is more precious than father and mother and all your ancestors your country, something more reverend, more holy, of greater value as the God's judge and any man that have sense. Here it is. You must honor and obey and conciliate your country when angry more than a father. You must either persuade her or do whatever she commands. You must either persuade her or do what she commands. You must bear in quiet anything she bids you bear, be it stripes or prison, or if she leads you to war, to be wounded or to die, this you must do. It's right. You must not give way or retreat or leave your post, but in war and in court and everywhere else. You must do whatever the city or the country commands or else convince her where the right lies, or convince her where the right lies. Oppose the law, take the opportunity to convince her where the right lies, and you're law-abiding by the higher principle of law. That's the law, he says, is the most significant thing in Athens. That law. Disagree? Convince us where the right lies. Did he do it? Therefore, he took this exceptional opportunity to dialogue with 501 people at once, expose them to philosophy, represent philosophy in himself, open himself up like the book, show himself in respect to all of his beliefs about his role as a philosopher in respect to himself, others, and the God. And that was his final testimony. So therefore, when they offered him the chance to escape from jail, he says, look here, I made the deal. I made the deal. I broke the law, and now I'm going to try to convince and persuade her where the right lies, and I'll take the consequences for that great gift. Well, his alternative was to prove them wrong, he would have had to prove that he was not a philosopher. 
That's right. <laughs> Good for you. I like that. Keep going. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. So he showed them that he was not a philosopher, that he would destroy his soul argument. That's right. That's right. And he would no longer be command, right? He would have break in the, the command of God. He'd given up his duty. Absolutely right. It would have been a greater, have been a greater mistake. Right. Yes, yes, a greater mistake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he took the lesser penalty. <laughs> he took the lesser penalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is one of the great dialogues, and one of the dialogues I like best. And therefore, I've tried to make the case that Socrates represents the spiritual dimension of philosophy. And one more point, now watch this one, this is a curious one. I mentioned in the last lecture that you could be Platonic, but you could not be Socratic. Because, number one, where do you get your job? God. Right. Most of us don't get our jobs from God. I didn't get a special recommendation. That's right. All right. Not only that, the second condition, right? Have a, a very interesting conscience that works with you from your earliest days and most remarkable about Socrates is, of course, that he obeyed it. But he had this new spiritual thing instead of a, a, a belief in a God that guided him in his whole life negatively. Well... If you have that, and you have the courage to follow it, and you have been persuaded to take on this job of being a philosopher, but that is rather curious, because what kind of a spiritual life do you think he must lead? Now, let me ask you, okay, let's see whether we can get a total picture of it, because this is a section I often reflect on. It gives me a chance to reflect on it with you. Um, And I have been made, and I have been commanded by the God to do this through oracles, dreams, and in every way in which some divine influence has ever commanded a man to do anything. What are all the ways in which there can be a divine influence on a man? Come on. What are all the ways? What are all the ways in which some divine influence can affect man, a man? Divination, inspiration. Inspiration, divination, meditation, contemplation, yoga, whatever it is. That whole set of ways in which any, right, which a God influences man, as far as Socrates is saying, I've gotten them all. Is that what he's saying? Yeah, that's what he's saying. That's what it includes. That's a, that's a very, very interesting and full life. And I maintain that I've been commanded by the God to do this through oracles and dreams and in every way in which some divine influence or other has ever commanded a man to do anything. That's, that's, that's quite a few, isn't it? In the mystery religions at that time, would the person undergo that kind of experience? I'm glad you asked. Thank you. I haven't got the faintest idea of the mysteries. I've read as much as I have been able to about them. But, you know, there's, there's more speculation than there is data. My understanding is that they do undergo some kind of revelations. Yeah, absolutely the right. Spirits or somebody, absolutely. Uh, rightly or wrongly, they uh, feel that they are being spoken to. That's absolutely right. That's one of the amazing things about the Greek mysteries. It seems to have gone on for a thousand years and no one has ever left an adequate record of exactly what was going on and what and, to, and you, described you know, it. Never. Socrates can uh, uh, attack the Delphi Oracle, but it was going on for like a thousand years. And you sort of have to accept the fact that these people weren't stupid. 
Oh, he has a great affinity with the Greek mysteries. Well, there are various places, the Mino, the Symposium, and other places where he talks about the mysteries. Well, the Delphi Oracle actually uh, supported him. Yeah. That's what he's saying. As a matter of fact, they were right. <laughs> <laughs> there was no one wiser. <laughs> he turned it around sure. in his own Socratic way, didn't he? Yeah. And proved it, and just, yeah, proved it on a level which most people would never have thought of. Uh, would you know how the church fathers viewed uh, Socrates? Or, well, there's one group, Origen, early fathers of the church. Right looked upon the Greek philosophy as a source to be used to interpret the scriptures. Right. There's another group, of course, that were hostile to it. But I mean, in particular... Clement is another one. Uh, Socrates is talking about, really, being what we, coming from a biblical background, sounds very much like a prophet. Uh, Oh, there was the belief in a, you know, a double, double revelation by reason and by faith. And the very point that you're coming to is one which many people held, which was the Greeks had a rational way of revelation, what they called partial revelation. Oh, oh maybe. And, and, and uh, parallel I'm to it. Start, but I'm talking about no, no, not our start. Uh, Socrates that's having voices speak to him. Uh, that's not uh, r rational. Oh, rational in that everyday sense, but it is still intelligible, yeah. Well, a person could have a feeling of commitment. You don't have to have a voice telling you. Mm -hmm. You have a feeling that you have a commitment to the truth. If you want to find the truth for what it is, you have a commitment to do that. You don't have oh. to have somebody's oh. voice tell you to do it. Huh. So that now, if we're going to run a class on philosophy, in respect to the, so the Socratic vision, would you agree you would have to establish it as part of a spiritual tradition? And you'd have to then pull in all of these things about his role and his respect for the gods and the way in which he perceives the gods relating to him. You'd have to then stress the fact that he was influenced by what he thought was divine presence and influence in a variety of ways, all the ways in which any man can ever be influenced. And therefore, would you not agree that if you're going to say that is philosophy, and if you want to get into it, how could you get into it? Take 30 units? Mm -hmm. It's a different realm. It's the realm of the spirit. And this is, of course, what Socrates brought us, Plato brought us, and it started the greatest, great philosophical, spiritual tradition called the Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition. Yeah. And well, this was a number of uh, people in the Catholic Church that followed Plato. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was he was almost predominantly Platonic until later on it turned yeah. Aristotelian. Well, even Aristotelian in those days had a Neoplatonic yeah. uh, aspect to it, very profound. But they turned against it when they discovered that the roots of their so-called Christian thought was in fact pagan and introduced by pseudo Dionysius and people like that. So that caused the split. That caused the major split. Well, uh, that's why I posed the question about uh, Socrates. Uh, yeah, but you see, the difficulty with Socrates as a spiritual figure is that where is the role for faith? There isn't. It's a belief, perhaps, but it isn't a saving belief. It's the role of perfection, perfecting your soul, perfecting um, your understanding, right? perfecting the soul through truth and understanding. If I remember correctly, the, the early church fathers who basically were in school in Greek philosophical thought is that uh, reaching that place when to them it seemed like all the philosophers were contradicting each other and uh, therefore being very impressed with the Bible that, uh, that it did seem to be a common theme with the prophets as opposed to the philosophers who seem to contradict each other. Now, see, we use the word philosophers to include what really should be called, see, 
if we were to use the language purely, I think we'd make a distinction and say there's a love of wisdom, <coughs> meaning by wisdom the, the uh, very nature of the divine <coughs> uh, in its most profound aspect penetrating the human dimension. But there's also a love of opinions. And there are many opinions that people have, such as it's impossible to ever have a penetrating insight into wisdom. It's impossible really to know the nature of the divine. And therefore, they construct other systems of thought based upon that opinion. So there's really two classes of thinkers. There's philosophers, philosophias, that's wisdom. And there's the philodoxia. Now, most philosophers today are philodoxias. They, they love collecting, distinguishing, and arguing different opinions. They have nothing to do with the spiritual dimension of philosophy. They don't meditate. They don't, con you know, they don't go into religious retreats. They don't try to cultivate the spirit. They're not involved in any uh, purification of such a nature that would bring about a reversion, a turnabout of their soul into some more, more divine element. That's not philosophy. Well, if you go to most, uh, when I was studying philosophy, <clears throat> the philosophers would, would uh, put down every other philosopher. Same thing in psychology. They put down all the other schools of thought no. to make themselves look good. They do the same thing in religion. Mm -hmm. You go to a to ministry, he puts no. down all the other religions to show that he's the only one that uh, has a true religion. They That's don't right. try to but you can take this tradition and you can line in that tradition the whole Neoplatonic tradition. You don't find disagreements in this tradition. There may be differences because they're trying to express something in the nature of the intelligible, but they don't, they don't argue against one another. Plotinus doesn't, Proclus, Porphyry, Iamblichus, Ceranicus, Numius. Well, philosophy got a Numius. bad reputation because there's so many people just arguing for the sake of argument. Yeah, in one of the, one of the great dialogues, the Phaedo, uh, Socrates mentions the fact that philosophy has a, a good name. That's a good name. He says, Therefore, a lot of people want to wear the cloak. Yeah. And they shouldn't pick it up. They should leave it alone. Yeah. But he calls himself, see, Socrates calls himself uh, in the Phaedo a mystic. That's what he is. He calls himself a mystic. Well, he does. Oh, yeah. Here, let me give you the quote. As a matter of fact, this is a rather... Uh, it's rather a fun quote. If I use this, I can, I can make a fun well, quote. He doesn't need any other. He probably needs to tell him to tell him because he perceives it within himself. Yes. He doesn't need any oracles oh. or any oh. uh, incarnate beings or anything like that. Now, you must indulge for a moment while I read this because there's a, there's a joke behind this. All right? Fair enough? Here it is. <clears throat> I'm in the Phaedo. He just finished making the point that wisdom itself, wisdom itself is a means of purification. Now here comes the quote. Indeed, it seems those who established our mystic rites were no fools. They in truth spoke with a hidden meaning long ago when they said that whoever is uninitiated and unconsecrated when he comes to the house of Hades will lie in mud. But the purified and the consecrated, when he goes there, will dwell with the gods. Indeed, as they say in the rites, many are called, but few are chosen. And these few are, in my opinion, no others than those who have loved wisdom in the right way. Find that an interesting quote? Many are called, but few are chosen. Well, how did it get into Plato 500 years earlier? That's easy. I'll show you why. Because there's a footnote in very small print. And the author, the translator, excuse me, says, Plato's text, the Greek means, quote, wand bearers are many, but inspired mystics are few. 
So he substituted a New Testament quote, <laughs> which changes the meaning, changes the meaning of the entire thing. Would you read the last one or can you please? The quote? Yeah, yeah. I'll read the whole, I'll read it again. But the purified and consecrated, when he goes there, will dwell with gods. Indeed, as they say in the rites, many are called, but few are chosen. And these few are, in my opinion, no others than those who have loved wisdom in the right way. Footnote. The Greek means wand bearers are many, inspired mystics few so that that's so so clearly he calls himself a mystic and that's what he is and therefore he's in this mystical tradition see we in the west have one of the richest mystical traditions of any people and we're the only culture in the world that denies it we don't want to teach it we only teach it in universities. It's not part of our ongoing culture. We don't cultivate it. It's there. We deny it. We're the only people to do that. And it's a fantastically rich philosophical spiritual tradition. Chinese don't do it. Hindus don't do it. Nobody does. We do it. Because of Christianity and, and the biblical tradition. Because the first thing they did when they gained power was to pass laws against this. They couldn't stamp it out. So they finally killed the philosophers. Closed the schools down. And that's the nature of the prejudice in the West. Uh, if you're a mystic, you're a heretic. Necessarily. Yeah, necessarily. And later, of course, mystics had difficulty in the church anyhow. But uh, Greek philosophy is a spiritual tradition. That's our spiritual tradition. In a sense, it's our religion without a binding, without a belief. And it's uh, vibrant, and it's going to be revived, will be revived. It's in inevitable. Thank you. Any more points? Thank you. I love doing it. That's one of my, you know, I love getting into Plato's dialogues and sharing it. And I uh, hope we made the point. Thank you. Hold it. Socrates reminds me of Christian Murray. Uh, there are features about him that are similar, though I've read several books on Krishnamurti, and he doesn't follow points into dialogue, though there are conversations. He doesn't follow the points the way Socrates follows points. He doesn't have the dialectic. He doesn't have that keen, keen clarity of mind. Is it, was it a Athenian law that if you didn't believe in the gods of the state there, that you were criminal? Yes, that's it. Yes, that's it. That's the law. There it is. It, it's a strong feeling, though. You have to understand, in a small society where you have a strong feeling of contamination and things can happen and the whole society can be wiped out. Um, here in Los Angeles, if we're not particularly happy with our neighborhood, we can switch to a new neighborhood. But uh, it's like uh, certain poor neighborhoods where there are um, gangs and drug taking and things like that, and it becomes horrible for all the people that are stuck there. Uh, it's, uh, and it is hard, it is hard. Um, a society has a responsibility to uh, to try and make it a um, safe society. Certainly, I think though. Uh, um, uh, on the other hand, I think that people, when they gain power, lack the wisdom to direct their own affairs, and periodically their social upheavals when society runs rampant over individual rights and the highest values and virtues. Well, it's right. it goes yeah. up and down and they're periodic, you know, I... But uh, in particular, uh, again, mentioning 
Alcibiades when uh, before the invasion of, of Syracuse when they woke up and all the statues were broken. Tell me, and there's some. It just, um, it just. Um, if it's necessary to purge Socrates from the state because of his alliance with Alcibiades, it's equally interesting to know that in the symposium there is a speech of Alcibiades where he admits that he's attracted to this tradition and he has to, as it were, plug up his ears and run, otherwise he would sit around until he's an old man sitting around listening to Socrates. And he says, but the applause of the many clamored in my ears and was too much for me. And so I turned away from this and followed the many. Uh, yes, but that's written by Plato. Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Alcibiades, that's where we get our information about Alcibiades. What you just talked about is the, the love and wisdom of one man mm -hmm. against the state that wouldn't go mm -hmm. spiritually. In the case of the Vietnam War, Mm -hmm. We had a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. I guess we have to characterize their attitude or their action as love of opinion because they were opposing the state which was going in the wrong direction. I think that what would have been interesting, if we could just make that one big change in our law. But there had to be a philosophical component to That's that right. resistance. That's right. Yeah, the big change, that philosophical component would be that people have the right to try to convince the society that they're wrong. We don't give them that right because in our legal system you can't speak for yourself except under certain certain restricted circumstances and you need a lawyer. Well, you have to work through some legal system. You can't simply go before a jury and plead your case directly to them. And this is the thing that was the uh, major feature in Greek society. Well, um, that's a strength and a weakness, depending upon how much. You're talking about uh, a citizen of the state, and that was a small state, and a citizen of the state would be equivalent to someone today who is like a member, a member of the um, Senate. I mean, uh, these mm -hmm. words, your mm -hmm. man on the street, really. No, I'm not sure I follow your point. Can you make a state it in another okay, one? Okay. Um, uh, now, I can't remember my figures. In Athens, wasn't the population around how much? I don't remember. 40,000. Okay. And how many would have actually been entitled to this? You see, um, there's a certain interest in history. I don't have it. Yeah, well... I, no, I, I, must have, no. I, I must make that clear. Right. Uh, see, historical questions are important yeah. questions. Right. But that is not something that I particularly explore. Right. Uh, all I'm and I, I, in other words, I can't, I can't answer uh, that, that if, question. Uh, if a lawyer today is... Uh, there is... Uh, accused of a crime and apparently you can be your own lawyer oh yes but they say you are a fool if you're being your own lawyer yeah. Yeah. but a lawyer can and uh, a person like socrates and and people of the patrician class could have that kind of skill. No, if you don't, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, but wouldn't you agree that anybody at the time who had any common sense should have told Socrates to shut up because he gave evidence against himself. He gave evidence against himself. He wasn't interested in pleading innocent to the charges. He went in there and gave them evidence to convict him. He wanted to use the opportunity of this to plead for the defense of philosophy, to remove the prejudice against philosophy, willing to use his life for that purpose. Opening up the book to say, yes, I've committed those things. That's right, I'm guilty of those things. By the way, I don't think the law is just, but you're right. Yes, that's right, that's what I've been doing. Isn't the spirit 
telling him that he has to do this? No, the Spirit only tells him what not to do. Warns him, not, it doesn't command. It doesn't tell him what to do, it only warns him against certain actions. So it's a negative, not a positive. Good. It's interesting that in, in Christianity, Calvin mm -hmm. put people to the stake just because they didn't agree with his uh, theology. Yeah. Like Swiggly and others. Oh, the, the crimes in religion are enormous, of course. Oh, yeah. And they demanded the people like, like uh, you know, Ignatius Leola. Yeah. He would have to go before the uh, Inquisition. Yes. Not because of anything he was doing wrong, but because he didn't have the credentials, they said. Oh. Yeah, well, there are many books written on the crimes of the church all the way back. Yeah. McCabe did one called The Testament of Christian Civilization. Gibbon did one, you know, about the role of Christianity and the decline and the fall of the Roman Empire. You know, there are many. Yeah. And uh, my particular interest is not history. I'd rather explore philosophy in the Platonic tradition than I would the, the crimes of the popes, which I'm sure, you know, would, would take me far a distance um, from where I want to explore. Do you consider, um, Scientology? Um, well, that's curious. Um, see, Scientology had a very interesting beginning. I was there at the time. Uh, I remember the first science fiction articles when they came out. That's where Dianetics came out first in science fiction. I went to Washington outside Chevy Chase, Washington, D.C., and <clears throat> met Ron Hubbard and, and uh, engaged him in a variety of things there. Some of my friends joined that group. I didn't because I didn't think he was going in a kind of spiritual direction that I thought was significant. Um, Essentially, I didn't see that he had a spiritual dimension that I could identify. His idea of time, uh, engramic theory, I think they call it today. No. But it, 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 uh, it, it's, um, um, how did he well, just let me just, up? hold it, no, no, let me just measure. Uh, what I mean by giving this personal statement is that was enough for me not to go any further with it and therefore I'm really not a spokesman for Dianetics. Some of my friends are, they've been involved in it for many years, but I'm not involved in it. Um, I, I think it's superficial in terms I'm of the spirit. I'm curious, did he come up with it through uh, the voice speaking to him, or did he come up through... Are you talking about Dianetics, Ron Hubbard or Socrates? Philosophy? Pardon me. Right. Ron, Ron well, I would say he should have gotten more into philosophy. I don't think he did get into it in the kind of philosophy I'm interested in. So, pardon me, pardon me. Uh, let me repeat, okay? I really don't know enough about it. I pulled out when I saw what he was doing and who he was working with and how he was working. I was involved in it only for a couple of weeks early. I uh, had talks with the man. Uh, and I turned off. And I had no interest in it since. These questions you have are worthwhile. It would take someone who has that kind of knowledge. I don't have it. Well, if I understand, L. Ron Hubbard developed a technique of therapy to help people. Yes, and particularly. A lot of people were helped. Yeah. And after a while, kind of the therapy kind of yeah. went out of, uh, out of hand. Kind of. But originally, it was good. A lot of people were generally yeah. helped. And I've been helped by doing some of the uh, sure. practices. Yeah. It's very practical. Yeah. But then he went, uh, he went on to other things. Yeah. Yeah. I've, as a practical therapy, I would say fine. Yeah. But in terms of the life of the spirit, it's superficial. Thank you.